So this past week, my husband and I got to take our son to kindergarten orientation. And he has been talking, my son, not my husband, he has been talking about kindergarten for months, just so excited. But when we were in the car on the way over to his school, he said, I'm a little bit scared about going to kindergarten. And as we walked into the school, he was really quiet. And it seemed like he was just kind of taking everything in, walking the halls of the school. And we told him what his classroom number would be, and so he was looking for that number, and then we finally found his class. And we went into his class, and we did a number of just really simple things. We got to meet his teacher. We got to put away his school supplies. He got to make a name tag out of puffy letters and then choose a locker in his classroom to put it on so that he could have that be his space. He got to walk around the class and just look at everything. He got to meet some other classmates. Some other parents and classmates were also in there. And that was it. And as we left, he just seemed so much more at ease. It seemed like he'd been fantasizing about what kindergarten would be for months and months and months. And now finally he had a picture of what his life would look like. So I'm wondering how many of you are parents or students or teachers and have been to a part of orientation or back to school stuff in the last few weeks? Okay, we got a lot of hands up there. And whether you've actually been a part of back to school events or not recently, you've been to back to school events and orientations in the past or maybe you're thinking about the orientation you've had at a new job where you had to learn the procedures and rules and login and passwords and all those things you need to get started in a new job. But the things that you do at orientation, especially for school, is you get to meet your teacher. You get to see who that person's going to be. You learn where your locker's going to be. You get the schedule for the year. You get to ask some questions. You get to see what your life is going to look like in this new chapter of life. And instead of just maybe having a fantasy or wondering what your life might look like, you get a picture of it. And you get to know how you can live into that for the year. That's what orientation does. Orientation. That's what Jesus was doing for his disciples in our Bible passage. He was orienting them to what life would be like if they continued to follow him. Now, I just shared with you part two of orientation this morning. But if you want extra credit, those students who really like to get extra credit, you can go and read Matthew chapter 16, the beginning of chapter 16, where we get part one of the orientation. In that part of the orientation, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Because there'd been a lot of buzz about Jesus. Some people were thinking, oh, he's just a rabbi. Some were thinking, no, this man, he must be a modern prophet. Or others thought, no, he's a healer. Others thought, is he John the Baptist reincarnated? Like, who is this guy? There is something special about this Jesus. And Peter pipes up, and he knows the answer, and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That was part one of the orientation, learning who their teacher was. Peter figured it out. Their teacher was the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's the part that he had. Then Jesus continues the orientation. Okay, now that you know who I am, I'm your teacher. And it's very fitting that we're talking about back to school orientation with the disciples because the word disciple means student or learner. So these are the students and the learners, and so now they're learning more. And Jesus says, this is our schedule of events this year. This is what we're going to be up to, and we're going to take a big field trip to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is where the temple was. It was the central place of worship for Jewish people. And so the disciples were like, yes, field trip. And Jesus said, when we get there, our leaders are going to turn against me, and I'm going to be tried and convicted and killed. And on the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. What? Uh, that's not what they were expecting to happen on the field trip. They thought they'd go and worship in the temple, go learn about historical things, 
not have their teacher be put to death. All of a sudden, Peter is thinking, this isn't what I signed up for. Now, I've seen you do all these miracles, Jesus. You've been healing people. People are following you. How could you say this is what is going to happen? I'm wondering if any of you have ever been to an orientation where you thought it was going to be something, and you show up, and it was completely different than what you thought you signed up for. Pastor Taylor has had that experience. I'm sure we all have, where we're like, uh, I thought I signed up for this class, and this is not what I thought it was. Now, I had that experience when I went to seminary. My husband and I started seminary together in the fall of 2002 in Chicago, and we'd been recently married. We'd left our grown-up jobs that we'd had after we graduated from college, and we were ready to learn about God and be pastors. And I didn't say this out loud, but I think secretly I was just wishing and hoping that seminary would be like four solid years of Bible camp. Because I love Bible camp. What could be better? Bible camp is the best. And so we showed up, and the whole first part of orientation was just about how to stay safe in, south, in the south side of Chicago. And so we learned about, um, we were all given a whistle that we could put on our keychains in case we're ever assaulted. And then we were told that we need to keep our cars secure at all times, don't have anything, no spare change in the center console. We were so freaked out, we went out that day and we bought the club to put on our steering wheel. Um, we were told when we walked around that you have to not look lost ever, even though we were completely lost. It was a new city for us. So it said, walk around and look um, like you're confident and be aware of your surroundings and don't be talking on your cell phone and don't have your earbuds in your ears. And we were learning all these things about how to stay safe in Chicago. And we thought, okay, we're not in Kansas anymore. And then the next day of orientation, we learn about seminary life. And what they told us is that in addition to it being rigorous academically, the study of the Bible, church history, theology, Greek, Hebrew, all these things, they said, you will probably question everything you thought you knew about God and faith and Jesus. Huh. That doesn't sound like Bible camp. That didn't sound like what I wanted to hear. And maybe that feeling of, huh, of the wind getting knocked out of you is maybe a little bit of what Peter was feeling when he heard that this man that he was following said, yes, you're going to follow me to the cross where I'm going to die. Now see, the part that Peter didn't listen to was also the part where Jesus said, and three days later I will be raised from the dead. He didn't get that part. But I also didn't pay attention to the part when my professor said, yes, your faith will be shaken. But after your faith is shaken and you've gone through a struggle in your faith, you will learn how to ask deeper questions. And you will learn that God is big enough to handle those questions and that wrestling and that that's okay and God is still there. I didn't pay attention to that part. That's what I would have to learn as I went. And that's what Peter had to learn as well. And Peter is someone who didn't have a filter between his brain and his mouth, and he just said whatever came to him. Like when he realized Jesus was the Messiah, he just blurted it out, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. But then when he heard Jesus' plan, he got really mad. He was thinking, no, 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 no. No, see, my idea, when I said you were the Messiah, what I thought is that you were going to become this powerful leader of a rebellion, that maybe you'd become this military leader of sorts, and you would help overthrow the foreign government that the Jewish people are being controlled by, and that you will create this Jewish state for us. And you, Peter was thinking it was going to be this human earthly power. And so what he said is kind of, I mean, Jesus, I don't want to tell you how to do your job here, but going to Jerusalem to die doesn't seem like a good way to lead a revolution. And what he actually said is, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. And at that point, Jesus has to reorient Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. 
you are a stumbling block to me. You are setting your mind not on divine things, the things of God, but on human things and human ways of thinking. I want to first explain, Jesus is not telling Peter that he is the devil. The word Satan is a word that means adversary. He says, because you're only understanding things in your limited human way of understanding and not opened up to the ways that I'm trying to teach you, you're being against the plan that God has. You're being an adversary. And I think being called Satan got Peter's attention. I mean, that would get my attention if Jesus called me Satan. Now, Peter and Jesus had some history. Jesus gave Peter his name. The name Peter means rock. Jesus said, I need you to be a rock who understands the ways of God and is willing to learn and follow me so that you can be a strong foundation for this church movement, movement to be built upon. Not a rock that's just stuck in the human ways of thinking that I'm going to stumble over as a stumbling block on my way to Jerusalem. Jesus needs to reorient Peter away from what his original thought of following Jesus would be. And then he orients and reorients all the disciples. He said, if any of you want to be my followers, you must deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. That sounds hard. Jesus is laying out a path of sacrifice of going through hard things, and it's not at all what they had signed up for. But Jesus isn't just asking them to do these things to make their life harder and less fulfilling. Jesus is actually asking them to follow him down this hard path of sacrifice so that they can receive something greater, so that they can find God's ways, so that they can experience redemption and the power of God that looks different than our human understandings of power. Jesus says, deny yourself. When Jesus says, deny yourself, when we have to deny ourselves, it means that we're not just trying to find our own identity in ourselves, but we're finding our identity as God's children. And when we deny ourselves, we can live into that fully of, I am God's child and how I live is living as a child of God. When Jesus asks them to do the hard thing of taking up a cross, Jesus is asking them to be able to be connected to and empathize with those who suffer. And Jesus is going to suffer on our behalf. And Jesus asks us to also be connected to those who are suffering. When Jesus says, follow me, and he is on his way to the cross, Jesus says, I need you to keep on reorienting yourselves towards me. Have me be your true north so that you will be able to make wise decisions in how you live your lives. It's a hard path, but it's a path that leads to life. And it may not be what you thought you'd hear when you said, yes, I want to be a part of this. I want to follow Jesus, but that's the path God has given us. How do we do it? It's not easy. Part of the way to do it is just to show up. We show up and we encourage one another as the body of Christ, as together we keep on looking to Jesus and we keep on learning from Jesus how to be about this way of God that Jesus reveals to us. Now, since it's the beginning of the school year, you might have um, class rules that look like this. Maybe you see these in your classrooms. For my kindergartner, I especially like rule number three, um, keep hands, feet, and objects to yourself. It's amazing how often I, I remind him of that. But we also have a whole bunch of good rules and guidance to help keep ourselves oriented towards Jesus. And we find that in the Bible. And we heard that in Romans chapter 12 that was read as our first reading. These are some of the ways we can encourage each other to be oriented towards Jesus. Number one, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Number two, love one another with mutual affection. Number three, serve the Lord. Number four, rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering and persevere in prayer. Number five, extend hospitality to strangers. It continues, number six, bless those who persecute you. 
Number seven, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Number eight, live in harmony with one another. Number nine, do not claim to be wiser than you are. Number 10, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And number 11, live peaceably with all. These are some things that we can commit to this year as we are all encouraging one another to orient one another towards our God. And I invite you to take part in that as together we keep being oriented to the love and the power of Jesus. Amen.